Anyway, good morning all. Uh, I would like to welcome all of you to GA uh, seminar. Those of you who don't know me, I am Baskaran Sandaram. I am the director of uh, uh, Groundwater Geoscience. And it's my pleasure to chair this seminar today. And we have got a wonderful seminar today by Dr. Claire Orlow. Uh, before we kickstart the seminar, uh, Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledges their continuing connections to land, water, sky and community. We pay our, pay our respect to the people the cultures, the elders past and present. With that, um, the today's seminar will be by Dr. Claire Orlow, and she will be presenting some of her work she has completed as part of her PhD. So it's a pleasure to introduce Claire, and she is, um, her presentation will be on Martian tectonic systems. And um, she is a geologist. I remember she started in 2014 as a graduate clerk. That's good. So in the last 10 years or so, she has been working across a number of projects, mainly focusing on the offshore uh, carbon capture and storage and petroleum prospectivity studies. And the last few years, she has been doing her PhD at the uh, University of Leeds in the UK, and she is happy to share some of the key highlights from her PhD studies. And um, please join me in welcoming Claire to deliver such a wonderful presentation. I'm looking forward to hear. Over to you, Claire. Okay. Um, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Vaskaran, for that introduction. Um, so, let me just, one second. Right, so first off, I would also like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people as the traditional custodians of the lands that we're meeting on today. And I recognize their continuing culture and connection to country and extend my respects to elders past and present. And given that we're talking about space today, I also acknowledge the role of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first astronomers. Um, who have been observing the sky for many thousands of years. So today we will be leaving Earth behind and talking about our planetary neighbour, Mars, and specifically the tectonic and volcanic systems of Mars. And even in the context of planetary geology, planetary tectonics is a pretty niche subject, and the major focus of the Mars research community is largely on the possibility of past or present water and habitability. But as we will see, the uh, understanding of the tectonic evolution of Mars is a fundamental starting point by which we can understand major geological processes that impact those topics. So over the course of this presentation, uh, we're going to zoom in from a planetary scale down to a specific region of Mars where I did my PhD work, and then we're gonna zoom back out again. So we'll start with an introduction to the planet Mars, then look at a region called Tharsis and why it's important, then zoom right down to my study area called Tempaterra and the results of the mapping work that I did there. Then we'll start to zoom back out and see what is the, those results in Tempaterra tell us about Tharsis. And then finally, what does that understanding mean for Mars more broadly? So an introduction to Mars as a planet. It's half the size of Earth, and has about 38% of Earth's gravity. But it is a terrestrial or rocky planet, so it has this familiar internal structure where it's been differentiated into a dense metallic core that's overlaid by a silicate mantle and crust that behaves in a brittle manner. Um, the lithosphere is somewhat thicker on Mars than on Earth. It's about 450 kilometres thick, and the average crustal thickness is between 30 to 70 kilometres. The surface of Mars is made up predominantly of basalt, but we do also see sedimentary rocks. 
uh, such as sandstones, mudstones and carbonates. And there is evidence of there being liquid water on the surface of Mars in the past. And Mars is interesting because it occupies a unique position amongst the terrestrial planets. So it has both long-lived tectonic and geological activity, but also preservation of that activity in its surface geological record. So both Venus and Earth have been very active planets, but their surfaces tend to be quite young. So we don't have a complete record of that activity at the surface. Whereas Mercury has um, a good surface record, but its geological activity likely stopped billions of years ago. So for Mars, we have both. So let's look some more at the interior workings of the planet. So Mars has a fundamentally different global tectonic setting to Earth. So Earth has plate tectonics and Mars has stagnant lid tectonics. So Earth's surface is broken up into a series of plates that have weak boundaries where the crust is part of this convective cell that rises at mid-ocean ridges and sinks at subduction zones. So in a plate tectonic regime, the lithosphere is actively involved in convective circulation of the mantle. So we see significant horizontal motions and deformation tends to be concentrated along these plate boundaries. And this is also, we see in the spatial distribution of volcanoes and earthquakes also aligned along these plate boundaries. In Mars's case, we've got a solid crust that's made up of essentially one single plate. Um, and we don't have any defined plate boundaries, but we do still have mantle convection. So in this case, the lithosphere is separated from that mantle convection, and that's why we call it a stagnant lid. We do still get mantle plumes, and these mantle plumes form both uh, tectonic and volcanic activity. But the deformation of the lithosphere as a whole tends to be more distributed around the planet rather than concentrated in, in uh, plate boundary zones. And the volcanoes and Mars quakes of Mars are also the same. They tend to be more distributed rather than concentrated in those thin ribbons. And since we don't have plate tectonics as a driver of structural processes on a planetary scale, deformation has to be driven by other sources. So this might be volcanism, magmatic intrusions, impacts, volume changes from water and ice, as well as global contraction of the planet due to cooling. So really, plate tectonics is unusual. Earth is our only example of it so far, and most bodies in the solar system have a stagnant lid tectonic regime. And even the early Earth may have had stagnant lid tectonics. So a good understanding of this tectonic setting is very useful. So another important part of investigating the planet's geological evolution is knowing when things happened in time. So many will be familiar, of course, with the geological timescale for Earth, but we have one of these for Mars as well. So in this case, this timescale is based on ages that are de determined from the accumulation of impact craters. So very broadly speaking, more craters, particularly more large craters, means a surface is older. And then through, through statistical analysis of these craters, we can determine what are known as absolute model ages. So we're able to put numbers around the ages of different units. So the timescale is broken up into three periods, the Noachian, Hesperian, and Amazonian, as well as this sort of more informal period known as the pre-Noachian. And these are broken up further into epochs, such as the early and late Hesperian and the early, middle and late Amazonian. But the thing to emphasize here is we don't have direct uh, age dating constraints, and so we do not have the same granularity as we have for Earth. So throughout the talk, I'll be focusing mostly on the Noachian and the Hesperian. They'll be the terms you hear me use most. And this is a, a very ancient period of Mars's history between three to four billion years ago, equivalent to the Archean on Earth. And also flagging that in, uh, in the Mars community, anything Amazonian is considered young, but that's the last three billion years. So just take that with a grain of salt. So in terms of data, what are we working with? So we have uh, dominantly satellite-based information for Mars. We've got beautiful high-resolution imagery across the whole planet. We have remote sensing spectral data sets as well as geophysical data like gravity, as well as global topography. We also have in situ analysis from landers and rovers in some locations and analysis here on Earth of Martian meteorites. But we are dealing almost exclusively with surface information. And again, we lack those direct age constraints. 
and there are no opportunities for field work, at least not yet. So compared to Earth, um, which has all that subsurface information, it has a variety of age dating methods, there's the opportunity to do field work and take direct observations, as well as the opportunity to ground truth some of that remote sensing data, we're really working with a restricted toolkit. However, on the plus side, we do have clearer surface expressions of structures at the surface because we have a lack of surface cover, so none of this pesky vegetation or human material. Um, we also have lower erosion rates, and so it's really good for observing structures over large geographic areas. So now we're going to focus in on one particular region, the Tharsis Rise, or just Tharsis. It's the largest volcanotectonic province on Mars. Uh, it takes up much of the Western Hemisphere and covers about 25% of the planet's surface as a whole. And you can see here, it's a very large feature. Uh, it exists, it includes, sorry, a 10 kilometre high topographic bulge. And this is topped by a series of very large shield volcanoes, which are in fact the largest in the solar system. It also has associated lava flows and many extensional and shortening structures that cover much of the Western Hemisphere and beyond. There's also the huge Valles Marineras Canyon system, which is this sort of light greeny line here. This is a huge scar that's sort of many times larger than the Grand Canyon on Earth, and it's the largest canyon in the solar system. So again, the theme here is that Tharsis is defined by these very large scale geological features. The volcanic activity in Tharsis is attributed to the presence of either a large single plume or a system of interconnecting plumes that's called the Tharsis superplume. And this uh, indicates that there's been abnormally long-lived and fixed deep mantle activity in this location. And because Tharsis is such a dominant feature, understanding it is really key to our understanding of the geological history of Mars. And the structures and volcanoes uh, across Mars tend to be concentrated in this area right across its lifespan. So its evolution has consequences for how we interpret and model the volcanic and climatic history of the planet as a whole. So looking at the volcanoes themselves in a little bit more detail, we've got the five largest volcanoes here, each of which is several hundred kilometers in diameter. We've got the two largest being Olympus Mons, which is the tallest in the solar system, about 26 kilometers from base to tip. Um, and then we've got Albamons, which is the largest by surface area, although it's only about seven kilometers high. Then there's the Tharsis Montes, which is this chain of three volcanoes, Arcea, Pavonis, and Ascraeus Mons, each of which are 10 to 15 kilometers high, and they are very strikingly aligned. There are also other volcanic, volcanic structures along this same linear trend, including Uranius Mons and Libetus Mons in this region known as Tempaterra, which I'll be returning to. That alignment is still of unknown cause. I know it might look like a hotspot track, but given we don't have plate tectonics, it likely has a different cause. So some suggestions have included a zone of weakness or fracturing, um, a migrating mantle plume, or even a, sub a subduction zone with island arc volcanism. There are also a number of other small volcanoes across Tharsis, or at least small by Tharsis standards, and hundreds of small volcanic vents some of which include evidence of relatively young volcanism in sort of the last few hundred million years. But activity at Tharsis began during the kind of pre-Noachian to Noachian period, about four billion years ago, but the surface is largely covered by younger Amazonian lava flows, which obscure a lot of the older features. So here in pink are those Amazonian flows, which are covering much of the surface, um, and also highlighted in that, uh, in yellow, is the dashed line representing that Tharsis Montes linear trend line. So the oldest preserved crust in Tempaterra tends to be towards the outer periphery of Tharsis. Again, this includes the region known as Tempaterra, which I'll come back to. So in terms of structures, we've got many extensional and shortening structures that have a radial or concentric relationship to Tharsis. And this has been used to infer that these, that regional crustal stresses from its development formed all of these structures. So first we have a system of radial extensional structures. So these are the features in black and radial in the sense that they radiate out in this sort of fanning pattern around Tharsis. 
These include normal faults and graben, particularly these long, narrow graben. Um, graben being where we have a section of the crust that's lowered relative to the surrounding area and it's um, bordered by two parallel normal faults. And here are some examples of these kinds of grabens on the surface of Mars. And groups of graben are called fossae on Mars. And their orientation is used to indicate the extension direction that's occurred. And then we have concentric shortening structures. So these are the red features and they're concentric or they have this sort of ring-like structure around Tharsis. These are mostly made up of wrinkle ridges, which is a planetary term for these kind of irregular, sinuous shaped features here that you can see in this image. And these are a combination of faulting and folding. And we find them on all kinds of different planets, even on the moon. And our best understanding is that they're the surface expression of thrust faults. So their orientation tells us about the direction of compression. So all these structures are really important because there are numerous theories and models about the timing and mechanism of Tharsis's evolution. Uh, and the arguments both for and against these different models is based on evidence that's provided by tectonic structures. This is because these structures record variations in the stresses in the crust through time, and they're one of our few available surface records of subsurface processes. So some early mapping suggested that more than half of these structures were Noachian in age, which produced this idea that activity in uh, Tharsis peaked in the Noachian decline through time and then has been largely inactive. But more recent work, including a, a, the newest global geological map, which came out in 2014, shows that there are much younger units in Tharsis. And this is starting to challenge this view. And there's a suggestion now that the peak of activity occurred a few hundred million years later in the early Hesperian period. So today I'll be focusing mostly on extension because these structures are concentrated around Tharsis, while the wrinkle ridges, those compressional structures, are distributed globally. So extensional features provide a unique avenue to understand Tharsis. So there are still lots of open questions about Tharsis, and some of our knowledge gaps include the timing and longevity of volcanic activity and the mechanism of formation of Tharsis, but also the relative contributions of regional and local drivers of deformation. So how much of the tectonic structures reflect stresses from Tharsis and are therefore a record of its evolution and how much are a record of local deformation processes. Also, we're unsure about the cause of that linear arrangement of the Tharsis Montes. How long has that trend existed? And then could um, underlying structural control, if that's what's forming that, that trend, could that have impacted the development of Tharsis more broadly? So we're going to zoom in even further now to the area that I studied for my PhD, which is Temper Terra. So it's a distinct plateau at the northeastern edge of the Tharsis rise. And it covers more than 2 million square kilometres, so about 30% of Australia's uh, surface area. So it's very large even compared to other structured regions around Tharsis. It has a very high density of structures, particularly extensional features. And we've got two dominant structural fabrics here. So this is a topographic image of, of Tharsis. We've got a north-northeast to northeast trending structures and an east-northeast trending structures, and something that's called the Tempe Rift System. This has been identified by previous authors, um, and this rift widens to the southwest from a single uh, deep graben to a more complex set of several, several slightly shallower an echelon graben to a wider zone of distributed faulting. Some other features around Tempaterra include three intra-rift volcanoes, which are these little um, black triangles, including Libidus Mons, which I mentioned earlier. We've also got a big canyon system at the western side of the plateau. Um, and along this western side in general, we tend to have older pieces of plateau that are surrounded by and partially buried by younger lava flows. So Tempaterra is interesting because its peripheral location means it's one of these areas which preserves evidence of the early development of Tharsis. So it has old rocks, so it has the possibility of preserving the evidence of older tectonic activity. And both the volcanoes and the rift lie along that Tharsis Montes trend line. And despite the many interesting features in the area, it's had very limited previous investigation. 
um, and most of the work has focused only on the rift and not on the larger plateau. So it's a good place to try and learn more about Tharsis and it has the potential to tell us something interesting about the timing of its development, uh, the stress regime through time and that Tharsis Monty's trend. But doing that requires understanding the structures better in both space and time. So a few knowledge gaps about Tempeterra include the timing of structural activity, particularly in light of the new information we have, so that revised geological units. Um, the updated map reassigned a lot of units here to a younger age. But we've also got improved image resolution, which means that we can observe cross-cutting relationships between faults in much greater detail. So this impacts the timing um, and relationships between structural groupings from earlier work. We have also um, are unsure about the source of the different fault trends in Tempeterra through time and the relationship between Tempeterra and this Tharsis Montes trend in terms of its timing and its influence on structures. So from those knowledge gaps, in my PhD work, I aim to use structural mapping to understand the tectonic and geological processes that have shaped structures in Tempeterra and then use that knowledge as a base to enhance our understanding of the tectonic deformation associated with the Tharsis rise through time. And we can kind of break that down into a series of very simple questions. Where are the faults? When did faulting occur? What caused the faulting? And what does all of that tell us about Tharsis? So starting with where are the faults? So using high resolution imagery and topography, I mapped structures at a sort of one to 300,000 scale. So I was getting features down to about a kilometer in length. I traced these features in GIS to produce a catalog of structures. And these are some examples of the kind of features that I was mapping. So I mostly mapped extensional faults that formed graben. So there are some examples here um, of these, each of these lines representing a normal fault. Um, and these mostly trended northeast and formed these long, narrow graben, typically one to two kilometres wide and tens to hundreds of kilometres long. I also mapped wrinkle ridges, which again are these compressional features, um, and these mostly trended north-south to northwest. This image is rotated, so north is pointing this way. And also mapped features known as pit crater chains, which are these linear alignments of small circular pits which are the result of subsurface dilation with material falling into that space um, underground. And this has been proposed to be a result of dilation due to dikes, but there is still debate about, uh, among scientists about that. And these were mostly associated with east-northeast trending graben. So from all that mapping, I produced this structure map for Tempeterra. It's the most detailed map of the region to date. Um, identified more than 23,000 normal faults, um, as well as 150 wrinkle ridges and 142 pit crater chains. And uh, normal faults, which definitely dominate the area, come in a range of orientations, including uh, north, northeast, east, northeast, and some northwest. But there is this zone of higher density faulting that has a sort of northeast trending orientation through the center of the plateau. For the wrinkle ridges, these were concentrated in the south, these are in pink here, these are concentrated in the south of the study area, while the pit crater chains in blue were mostly in the west of the area, and again these were associated with the east-northeast trending faults. So there have been multiple generations of normal faults which produce this complex pattern of many cross-cutting structures, and I identified 16 different fault sets based on their orientation, their age, and their cross-cutting relationships. And this here is a map um, of just the normal faults, so just the, the gravens and those extensional structures, coloured by their fault set. So we can see that there's some very complex cross-cutting and overprinting relationships here. And many of the faults do show evidence of interaction with older fault sets, and there's there been very likely some kind of reactivation. So now that we know where the faults are, we can consider when did the faulting occur. So I used both relative and absolute age dating methods. So in terms of relative dating, I looked at uh, cross-cutting relationships between the faults and geological units and other structures. So first off, you know, looking at using stratigraphic principles to look at the faults in relation to the geological units. So here's an uninterpreted and interpreted view. We can see some of these uh, lines, which are normal faults, on the yellow section being covered up 
by a younger orange unit, while another set of faults cross-cuts both the younger and the older unit. So that's a way we can determine the relative order of those structures in relation to the, ge the geology. Um, but we can also look at the interaction between different generations of structures. And these are some examples of uh, different cross-cutting relationships that I observed between faults. So a really common thing we would see is this kind of zigzagging pattern. So we have an older fault which is straight and a younger, or these are graben, sorry, and a younger graben which is uh, forming this sort of kink as it travels up along this older ex pre-existing structure. And then this example on the side here is showing the interaction between grabens and wrinkle ridges. So we have originally a northwest trending graben which has been partially inverted by the formation of that wrinkle ridge. And then the whole system is being cut again by a northeast trending set of graben. But these relationships are very much not always clear cut, um, but they are very useful. So then to provide absolute model ages, so these are ages with a number rather than just a relative position in time, um, I used the buffered crater counting approach. So this allows you to determine directly the age of linear features. So basically I was looking for the number and the size of craters which came after the faults. So there's an example here of a crater which is younger than the faults, it's partially obliterating those faults and, and overlaying them compared to a structure, a crater which is older than the faults. So you can see those faults cut down into that crater. So looking at these kinds of craters and trying to count how many there are and how large they are, you can use statistical analysis um, to eventually end up on one of these crater counting plots which gives you an age. And these ages represent the end of formation or the last reactivation of those fault sets. So by combining that age information, I was able to organize the fault sets into their relative and absolute time order and create this timeline of temperature and structural activity. So the arrows on this timeline are indicating the extension direction. So this is based on the very simple assumption that extension is perpendicular to the main orientation of the faults. And then this circle here is indicating radial stress around the Tharsis Mont, uh, the uh, Libetus Mons volcano. We've got activity in Tempeterra from the Middle Noachian through to the early Amazonian, um, and fault activity in general in Tempeterra is younger than previously thought. We've got a peak in activity in the early Hesperian rather than in the Noachian, but we do still have some of those older structures being recorded. And by looking at the changes in the pattern of these extension directions, I identified three stages of tectonic activity that were marked by changes in, the dom in that dominant extension direction. So these include stage one, which is uh, through the middle Noachian to beginning of the early Hesperian. And this is mostly north and northwest oriented faulting um, through the center and west of Tempeterra. Then stage two in the early Hesperian involved mostly northeast oriented faulting, and this is along that Tharsis Montes trend. And then stage three is made up of east-northeast trending faulting um, from the early to late Hesperian, and this is right across Tempeterra. But after stage three, the activity, the fault activity in Tempeterra really declined, um, but we will revisit those uh, stages in a bit more detail in a moment. So now we can consider what caused all of this faulting. So taking that map and that history, we can try to determine the origin of the structures by looking for evidence of the different formation models at the surface. So again, we're looking for different drivers of deformation other than plate tectonics. So some of the potential sources that I considered at both a local and regional scale um, include volcanic uplift, dike intrusion, flexural loading, uh, magmatic underplating, impact cratering, as well as a whole range of other things. And there are some examples along the bottom here of some conceptual models of some of these types of processes. And then to assess those, I compiled the expected surface evidence for each of these different mechanisms. So looking for the spatial pattern of faults, the graben morphology, topographic signatures, the distribution of strain, uh, crustal thickness responses and gravity. And I used this approach to investigate the structures from each stage and interpret the origin of faulting through time. And I'll go through those in a minute. Um, another thing that was important was the role of strain localization, which is um, important in helping to initiate extension. So this is where we have the concentration of strain in one area, 
So this might look like large border faults in a rift system or zones of particularly dense faulting compared to the areas surrounding them. And the cause is usually uh, magmatic intrusion and heating or pre-existing zones of weakness or pre-existing underlying structures, as well as other causes. But magmatic processes are particularly important for Mars because that intrusion and that heating creates weak zones in the lithosphere. And those weak zones can then interact with any form of stress generation to help initiate the formation of those structures. So looking first at the origin of stage one in the middle Noachian to late Noachian, um, we've got predominantly north trending graben with some minor northwest turning structures and this system of very large north-south canyons, which likely had an initially um, structural origin. But the orientations of these structures have no relationship to any predicted fastest stress patterns or to any of the major volcanoes. So, but we do have an incomplete record of this period. So largely the structures are buried or eroded and what is preserved are in areas of high topography. So we have the most uncertainty about this stage. But nevertheless, my interpretation for stage one is that it's a result of local magmatic underplating and associated heating and uplift. So magmatic underplating is where we have um, basaltic magma that's trapped or stalled in the crust due to density differences. This has weakened the lithosphere and the uplift has helped to form a northeast oriented rift system. So uh, we've also got vertical fracturing above the magma uh, intrusion, which provide, provided pathways for dikes and controlled the alignment of some of the faults. So this stage is really the effect of local sources of stress. And these uh, areas of magmatism are likely part of this, of a widespread initial stage of volcanism that occurred in the Tharsis region, but actually predates the regional stress and the large scale growth of what we now think of as the Tharsis rise. So for stage two, we've got two major fault sets, one trending northeast in light blue and one trending north northeast in dark blue. And these are coeval, so they're forming at the same time. So this created, um, has created this localised zone of high density faulting that um, is concentrated along that Tharsis Montes trend line. Um, and it also forms the Tempe Rift system. The northeast faults, in, again in light blue, are parallel to the rift axis and to the Tharsis Montes trend, while the north northeast faults in dark blue are oblique to the rift axis, but they are orthogonal to the um, proposed extension direction. So we've got a system of also an echelon graben as part of the rift here, and there's a lot of deflection of the faults around the Libetus Mons volcano, which is located just here. And uh, around uh, Libetus Mons, we have this set of circumferential faults, the pink faults here, forming a ring around that volcano, as well as another interesting kind of bow tie shape. It's not super obvious in this map necessarily, but uh, we've got another volcano at the center of this bow tie. So my interpretation for this stage is that we have the interaction of regional stresses from the growth of Tharsis with magmatic activity that was highly localised along the Tharsis Montes trend, which generated oblique rifting. So we've got underplated magmatic material and dikes that are weakening the lithosphere, um, again in this magmatic zone um, associated with the Tharsis Montes trend. And this is controlling the axis of the rift as a whole, and it's acting as the source of those intra-rift volcanoes. But then the regional stress field with these blue arrows is centered down near Syria Planum, which is a, an uplifted region far to the southwest, which is proposed to be an early center for Tharsis's growth. And it's producing east-southeast, west-northwest extension in Tempeterra, which is interacting with this northeast oriented magmatic trend to form oblique rifting. And also during rifting, we have additional local stresses provided by volcanic loading and deflation around the Levitas Mons and volcanic uplift around this other small volcano. So for this stage, we have the combination of local and regional Tharsis related sources of stress. Then for stage three, we have this uh, pervasive regional fabric of distributed graben that are trending east northeast right across the area. These faults form continuous narrow graben rather than forming um, uh, localizing onto border faults like we saw in the rift system of stage two and they also interact with the volcanic units along the western edge 
So my interpretation for stage three is that we have laterally propagating dike swarms from a plume centered in Tharsis. And so the, the dikes are traveling many thousands of kilometers and they're producing these uh, continuous graphing systems. Um, but also noting here that the localizing effect of that Tharsis Montes trend that traveled through here has waned and is no longer affecting this system. So these graben and uh, the dikes are developed in a regional stress field that's been generated by the growth of Tharsis. Um, and it's producing south, southeast to north, northwest extension locally, which indicates the center might be slightly further north than in the previous stage. And tectonic activity was occurring while there's major Tharsis volcanism ongoing because we have some graben structures that are covered by these younger lava flows and then more structures with the same orientation that cut through those lava flows. So this uh, stage is reflecting the effects of regional Tharsis centered sources of stress. So looking at that all together, we've got magmatism of various scales that are driving tectonic activity in Tempeterra through time. But each tectonic stage has a different primary driver and different relative contributions of regional and local magmatic sources. So importantly, not all of the deformation in Tempeterra is Tharsis related. But Tharsis related stresses do play an increasingly dominant role in Tempeterra through time. But local drivers of deformation were most important in the period before Tharsis and early in its development. And again, those local magmatic sources are very important as mechanisms for strain localization and lithosphere weakening to allow the initiation of faulting. So now we can start to zoom back out again and consider what does all of this tell us about Tharsis? So again, coming back to the point that not all the deformation in Tempeterra is Tharsis related. So we've got complex faulting um, and we've got a combination of overprinting regional and local patterns. And if this is true for Tempeterra, then it's likely true for other regions around Tharsis, which means that we need to do a careful review of the structures and their interpretation. And it's useful then to isolate what are the regional patterns which are of relevance to the large scale development of the region. So I identified two of these regional deformation patterns related to the development of Tharsis. We've got the yellow faults, which are north-northeast trending faults from stage two, and then the pink faults, east-northeast trending faults from stage three, both the early Hesperian in age. The other fault sets can be put aside because they either predate Tharsis, they reflect local processes, or they relate to a specific cause, such as the, in this case, the Tharsis Montes trend. So when we're looking at models of Tharsis formation, this provides us with some clearer criteria of things to compare it with in terms of um, structure orientations and how the patterns of regional stress have evolved through time. So based on those identified trends, we can compare those structures to existing models um, to try and understand formation mechanisms. So we have here some models that show predictions of stress types and stress orientations based on different op um, observations, but there are many more than this. And for each one, we have a little zoom in over the Tempeterra region with the main fault trends shown. So the models that had the best fit to the regional structures included flexural loading, isostatic compensation and mantle plume dynamics with the intrusion of dikes. I won't go through these in detail because there's a lot, a lot to cover, um, but the main theme that I wanted to pull out here is that when we look at these in detail, the fault trends from stage three, so the pink faults, on the whole are better predicted by these stress models than the yellow faults and the north northeast trending faults. And this is telling us that our current models have an incomplete understanding of early Tharsis derived stresses and how they're influencing faulting. But also the fact that we have this shift in the, the major deformation orientation between stages is indicating that really no single static stress model is going to fit all of the fault data. The mapping that I've done of Tempeterra also provides information on the timing of the Tharsis rise and of the Tharsis Montes trend. So for Tharsis, it supports a later development um, from the large of the large scale growth of Tharsis. So this is for the topographic bulge and the main volcanoes, suggesting it occurred in the early Hesperian rather than in the Noachian. And also that major tectonism in Tempeterra was restricted to a relatively <coughs> narrow period um, within the lifespan of Tharsis, so just in the Hesperian. 
For the Tharsis Montes trend, I identified there was a progression in age and size between the volcanic centers along the trend. So there were older, smaller volcanoes at the edges and larger, younger volcanoes towards the center, culminating in those the three Tharsis Montes volcanoes. So the alignment of very early Noachian volcanic edifices with this trend indicate that whatever underlying structure is controlling it, it was in place during the initial early Noachian volcanic period. And so it predates the major development of the Tharsis rise. Um, but it didn't exert any major control on the development of tectonic structures until magma became highly localized along that trend in the early Hesperian. My results also generally support the idea of long-lasting volcanism in the Tharsis region, um, but that this, uh, the early phases of that involved um, a precursor period of distributed volcanism and development of the Tharsis Montes trend before the main growth of what we now think of as the Tharsis rise. So what are the implications of this then to our understanding to Mars more broadly? Well, the volcanic history of Mars uh, has a very significant impact on the climatic evolution of the planet and therefore its potential for liquid water and for past habitability. And Tharsis is essential to that volcanic history because it's the largest and the longest lived source of volcanism on the planet. So volcanism that's been active not just over the lifespan of Tharsis, but in the same location suggests that we've had a very long lived, stable dynamic regime um, and that magma supply has been on a vast scale. The later growth of Tharsis, suggested by my work, suggests there's been a shift in the timing of associated volcanism and volcanic outgassing. So this image on the left is uh, from the Reykjanes Peninsula in Iceland of a magmatic um, a, a eruption and some associated outgassing. And volcanic outgassing is the main source of atmospheric CO2 and water vapour on Mars both of which are greenhouse gases. So these have the potential to produce a thicker atmosphere and potentially increase the surface temperature. And so this allows uh, for the possibility of precipitation and for the, possible, the possibility of liquid water being stable at the surface. And then we know this has happened at some point in the past because of the evidence we have of um, flood channels and river valleys. We've also got deltas and clay minerals so we know at some point there was uh, favorable conditions, but we're not quite sure when that was. So the Tharsis rise likely impacted the composition of the Martian atmosphere. So a later development of Tharsis means a shift in the timing then of potential weather conditions and potential um, conditions that were more favorable to life. So from the starting point of structural analysis and tectonic systems, we can understand how and when Tharsis formed and by understanding Tharsis, we have a better understanding of the evolution of Mars as a whole. So what have we learned? We've covered a lot today. Um, so first, let's return to the research questions. So in terms of where are the faults, uh, my detailed mapping shows that we have cross-cutting faults all across Tempaterra, but we've got this zone of high density faults along the Tharsis Montes trend. Uh, when did faulting occur? Well, it, it um, the tectonic activity spanned hundreds of millions of years, but it peaked during the early Hesperian. And we've got a structural evolution that's made up of three main stages. In terms of what caused the faulting, we've got different magmatic sources on both local and regional scales that are driving tectonic activity in Tempaterra. And in terms of what all that tells us about Tharsis, we've got evidence that supports a later evolution of the Tharsis rise and long-lived volcanism as well as some refined criteria for Tharsis formation models in terms of what those structures look like in Tempaterra. And then more broadly, I'm seeing that volcanism and tectonics are, are highly linked on Mars and that you don't need plate tectonics to get major surface features. And really it's important that a, st a solid structural understanding is essential to any planet um, as it has important implications for the nature of the body but also other aspects such as its volcanic and climatic history. So I'll finish with this shameless plug for two papers that I have um, out on this topic. Uh, they're both fully open access. So if you'd like to read more about it, you can, uh, but otherwise I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.